Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Looking to the East. Uh, in our one o'clock block with Steve Zercher, who joins us from Kansai Gaidai University in Kobe, Japan. Hi, Steve. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Good to see you again. It's my pleasure. So, uh, you know, uh, there, we've had a number of shows and, um, you know, foreign service people come and tell us about the declining relationship between China and the United States. And yeah. I mean, some of them feel that it's, it's all Trump's fault. Uh, Others feel that um, uh, Trump was uh, operating on the basis of a, a relationship that was already declining. <clears throat> and certainly uh, Xi Jinping is making a mess in, uh, in Hong Kong and threatening Taiwan. Um, and so what we have is a very aggressive China under an increasingly aggressive leader, Xi Jinping. Uh, the new security law in, in Hong Kong makes that clear. Yes. Um, so, so I, I'm thinking that, you know, there must be some kind of dynamic going on with Japan too. Japan's right there and, and yes. it has to be in China's gun sites, so to speak. So can you talk about that? Tell us what's going on. Yeah, that, this is a very important issue for Japan for a variety of reasons, which uh, we can talk about. Regarding your, <clears throat> excuse me, your first point. Uh, about Trump and his uh, impact in terms of the Japan-China relationship or the U.S.-China relationship. You may recall, uh, under Obama, uh, he, he promoted the Asia pivot. Do you remember that, that term? It's like, okay, America, we've always been focusing on the Middle East. We've always been focusing on Europe for historic reasons. But the future, economic future, the economic growth of the world is no longer in those regions. It's out here which is just clearly the, the case. If you look at the growth rates of the countries in Asia, they far surpass the United States and Europe. But when Trump came in, uh, because he is anti-Obama, right? Everything Obama did, he had to undo. This was his personal agenda. It's very clear now after three and a half years. Um, so he undid the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, the, one of the reasons why Obama was supporting this and Japan was a very key supporter of this, was to limit China, to limit the economic influence of China, which Japan and the United States has recognized as becoming very, very powerful. But by undoing that, it kind of put Japan out in the cold. It lost the number one economy. It lost its major partner on this effort. So that's how things got started under Trump. It really was kind of a confusing move, and it was something that was not perceived positively within Japan. And then over the years, as you know, uh, Trump has gone back and forth. China is very important. You know, we, we're not going to criticize China when they are overly aggressive, like in Hong Kong. I, I don't think Trump has said much at all about that, or it, it, he, maybe he said a few things. He was forced to do that. So there's been this background of this uneven relationship. It started very badly with the withdrawal by the United States of the TPP. So it's been confusing for Japan what to do. So that's kind of the context of how Japan views the U.S.-China relationship and how it's influencing Japan. Now, specifically to your question about Japan and China, the first thing I need to say is that Japan and China have been in economic and political relations for 2,000 years, Jay. The first recorded document that shows exchange between the two countries is 57 AD, so oh. almost 2,000 years. <laughs> so I just want to say that so you and your viewers recognize this relationship is in a much longer context than we Americans think about. We tend to focus on what post-World War II, what's happened since then. Um, so it's a very complicated relationship. There's elements of Chinese culture throughout Japan, the food, the language. So in Japanese people, maybe they don't really recognize that, but if they stop and think, you know, our, our kanji comes from China, the food sources, the philosophy, the education system, Confucian values, all of those things are fundamental parts of the Japanese culture. So that just shows the context of how much exchange there's been over the years and China's role in Asia and influencing all of Asia and in particular influencing Japan. Now, let's bring that up to today. How does Japan manage China? and it is complicated. So Japan's caught, the number three economy is caught in between the number one economy and the number two economy. And the way it's uh, expressed in a very, very 
simple way is that economics, hot. Politics, cold. So economically, Japan recognizes how important China is. Uh, China is Japan's number one trading partner and has been that way for the last 15 years. Uh, there's more Japanese offices in China than any other place in the world, more than in the United States. There are thousands and thousands of Japanese people working in China supporting manufacturing. So economically, there's integration and it's very, very tight. But politically, as you know, Japan is aligned with the US, right? So it looks for leadership on foreign policy to the United States. So Japan is caught in this, this kind of trap between their economic influences and their economic um, goals and development and growth and political leadership, foreign uh, policy leadership, which is looking to the United States. So it's a very difficult situation that Japan's in. Abe, to his credit, is walking a tightrope between these two countries and it's getting worse. Uh, as you pointed out, China's becoming more aggressive worldwide and also in the Asia Pacific region. And there are specific conflicts on territory between Japan and China that's in the news every day here. So, but on the other hand, this is an example of how Japan will defer to China. <clears throat> this, this year in April, uh, President Xi was planned to come to Japan for an official visit. And then COVID happened, right? And it was it originated in China. Japan, uh, the United States cut off uh, Chinese tourists, I think in March, early March, Japan did not. Chinese tourists were coming into this country from Wuhan without being tested or anything. And why did they do that? Because they didn't want to create a sense of conflict uh, with President Xi's visit, which was going to be hopefully in April. So it, there's a very clear example of how Japan is deferring to China in order to try and solidify the relationship between the two countries. So you see, it's a, it's a very complicated question and Japan's in a very difficult position right now. The last thing I'll say, Jay, I know you have many questions you wanna ask is, I, my sense is in terms of what Trump's doing to trying to get back to that point, um, maybe this is partially my own thinking, but I have a feeling that Japan, because they look at things in a longer context, like 2000 years, relationship with China. You know, Trump may be gone in a few months, or even if he wins again, that's just another four years. What's four years out of 2000? So I think Japan kind of looks at this relationship with China beyond Trump. Long answer there, Jay. I hope that wasn't too long. I hope we didn't lose our viewers through my long answer oh, there. Oh, I don't think so. That, no, no, you're, you're really uh, up on this. So, well, you know, one thing that strikes me is that it's something you and I have talked about before, is that you know there's a dynamic, of course, between Japan and China. There has to be in a, in a time where everything is changing all around us. But there also, and we talked about this before, there also is a dynamic between Japan and the US, mainly mm -hmm. because Trump is unpredictable. He comes up with new things. You don't know what he's gonna do from day to day. Right. And, I, and right. I keep hearing that, I, that particular uh, process, that particular characteristic, in connection with the U.S. This, uh, this is the number one complaint, you know, beyond the, the goofiness and all the other crazy stuff. It's that we don't know what America is going to do week to week. And business people hate that. And Japan's government, which reflects business interest, hates that. It's really, really difficult. It's hard. It's but China's hard taking advantage of this. I think part, a partial reason why China is more aggressive is they realize that Trump is inconsistent. And, you know, what's he going to do? So I think that's a, also a part of what's going on in this region is that China's recognized through COVID and through lack of leadership from the United States, their goal of establishing dominance as a superpower, which frankly, I think we all recognize they are, but they still have that goal. Uh, they're being able to accelerate their plans to achieve that. Yeah, <clears throat> so I, you know, this, uh, in the United States, we, we think that, um, you know, this whole election thing between Trump and his convention and Biden, his convention and all the stuff about the election and the, uh, the post office, it's limited to a, a U.S. audience, not, not, it's a worldwide mm -hmm. audience and everybody in the world in the smallest town in, in, 
in um, in central India is going to know what's going on. Um, yes. And, and every government in every country is going to be following this um, and see how it affects them. And I think your your uh, your comment a moment ago about how um, th that has affected um, and, and to some extent undermined policy with the U.S. by Japan and China is because of Trump's inconsistency. Nobody mm -hmm. nobody trusts him to be consistent. And uh, you know I, they say that in China stability is everything. That's what Xi Jinping must he must have. He must. He yeah. must take steps for that. Um, in fact, you know, that's one of the reasons arguably why he's being so hard on Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is a is a model of a, a democratic protest that could be repeated um, in mainland China. And he's got mm -hmm. to put it down or wind up losing stability in mainland China. So mm -hmm. and I think I would guess you can confirm or deny, but um, that the, the same need for stability exists in Japan, maybe in different yeah. ways, but I think the government and the, the various um, government officials in Japan want to see stability. They, they do not want to tolerate instability. Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a general principle uh, of business. Uh, you, you cannot make plans if you, have a, you don't have a clear idea of what will happen six months from now or 12 months from now or 18 months. And um, the Asian cultures, I can speak more generally here. I have experience in China, Korea, and Japan. Um, they, that's one of the principles. That's one of the things that uh, people expect out of the government is to provide a stable environment, a healthy, stable environment where people can grow and things can progress. And anybody who upsets that in one way or the other, uh, that's, that's bad. And unfortunately, uh, even though Trump is not an Asian, but he's running the United States as president. And that, as you point out, has a strong influence on this region because of the economic and military power of the United States. Uh, it's, it's really been difficult. <clears throat> so it so makes what? the job of Abe even harder because he's caught between Japan and China. You know, Ch China is very clear what they're doing. There's no question about what China's doing. Everyone understands that, right? But then on the other side, you have the United States and you have the TPP being rescinded within two days of a new president coming in, something that they've been working on for years and years and years. And the whole motivation was to limit China. It was in the US best interest to do this and yet Trump undid it. So you have those types of things. It makes it very difficult for Abe to figure out how to not offend China, how to continue to foster that economic relationship, which is so important to Japanese businesses. But on the other hand, Historically, politically, Japan is linked to the United States and they have a erratic partner there. So I, maybe Abe, although he's, he's lately, he's been going to the hospital, he may be on his way out. The popularity of his cabinet now is at, at lows. Uh, but whoever would come in behind him would have the same problem. How do I balance the United States and China? So if Biden comes in, maybe even though he's an unknown, perhaps they would expect that there at least would be a consistent policy against China, the US-China relationship would be predictable, yeah. and that would probably be perceived as a positive. So we, we follow Frank Ching, who is a journalist in Hong Kong, and um, you know his view uh, a couple, three months ago was that China wanted to see Trump win. And so if Trump approached China for help, as he said he was doing, just mm -hmm. like he's approached Russia for help now <laughs> and in 2016, I don't think there's any question about that. The man yeah. has no, no shame, no principles. He, he approached wants to both of them for help. Um, right. that, that Xi Jinping was uh, somewhat sympathetic with that earlier this year. Um, but now, I think, from just from our sources and our analysis here after all the discussion about China's relationship with the U.S. I think that may have changed and that Xi Jinping really um, doesn't want to see Trump uh, elected because he's, as, mm. as we have said, too unpredictable. Um, mm. He offers Xi Jinping an opportunity to drive a truck through all those mistakes that Trump makes. 
uh, and yeah. take advantage of, of, of Trump's uh, uh, incompetence. But at the same Clearly. time, that, that instability really bothers him. And so Trump's request mm. for help from China is not being met these days. And of course, I think China is going to be circumspect about it. But I think they're probably mm. saying, no, no, we're not, we're not going to help you. You know, go go and talk Russia. Don't don't ask us. We, we, we're, not going to, <laughs> we're not going to do the social media thing. We're not going to do the, uh, you know, in, Internet Research Agency. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're not going to do that. And so uh, I think it, it becomes more and more clear that Xi Jinping is, is waiting Trump out. Um, he's probably keeping his options open, but he doesn't want to affirmatively help Trump win. Okay, so the, the question- Yeah, really I, I have absolutely no information. This is pure speculation on my part, but I would imagine that the LDP, the, the dominant party here, who's again, the prime minister is Abe, they may also be doing scenario planning and hoping that Trump is out at this point too. That is, I, there's no official information on that. Nothing I picked up from the press, but I'm just my own guess after being here a while, many decades, they may be hoping the same thing. I mean, in Japan's case, it's even worse than China because China's taken advantage of Trump's incompetence. And Japan hasn't been able to do that because Japan's linked so closely politically to the United States. They've kind of suffered along with the rest of us in America through the lack of leadership and inconsistent. I mean, and North Korea is a perfect example. You know, for Abe was using North Korea for nationalistic purposes, making them the, the boogeyman, trying to use that as a case to change the constitution, as we were talking about before, to allow a, a Japan to become military pro, militarily proactive. Yeah. And then who shows up there and takes pictures with his buddy, you know, without any advance warning to Japan and completely destabilizes, just drops everything out from Abe's campaign to turn North Korea into the military enemy to justify his own domestic political agenda. It just evaporated, you know, and Abe looked like a joke. Yeah, Abe has been saying, North Korea, North Korea is so terrible, so terrible. And then Trump goes there and says, oh, he's my friend. He's my buddy. I'm gonna take pictures. You know, things are gonna be better. The nuclear program in North Korea is going to end now. It was insane. If, if I were Abe, I would be um, I, I, I'd be very careful about Trump because Trump, you know, in making these um, strange moves, he he does have the effect of stabbing people in the back in terms of foreign policy. And, and yeah, he, I think he, his motivation Japan. was was his own self -aggrand, aggrandizement, his, yeah. his own PR, yeah. and uh, American president, the first American president to go to North Korea. Uh, he figured, oh, this will, I don't know what he thought, but anyway, yeah, he, I, maybe the impact on Japan and Abe uh, probably never crossed his mind. Yeah. And so, well, I, if I were Abe, I'd, I'd wonder if, if uh, Trump was reelected, whether he'd still have the same kind of support from the U.S. If I were, uh, if I were uh, the, the premier of Taiwan, I would have the same concern uh, whether Trump would support Taiwan going forward. I mean, he sent somebody from from his, I forget who it was, somebody from the State Department over there a week or two ago to, to uh, uh, evidence some support for Taiwan. But in the long term, I don't, I don't think they can trust him. I think they know they can't trust him. So it, it gets, as you said, it gets very complicated. So yeah. here's Xi Jinping is getting more aggressive. Um, Japan has this kind of conflict. They don't want to appear to be shoving off from Trump. On the other hand, they're probably waiting for a better deal with Biden. Biden would give him a better deal. He'd return to the Obama pivot, as you mentioned. Probably, um, yeah. It, it would, yeah, it'd be a better deal for Japan. I mean, uh, and, and at the same time, you have to appreciate, there are a lot of people in this country who really have come to hate China because they listen to Trump. His, his leadership is so strong. I, that's, I put that in quotes on the point of let's all hate China. Let's punish China. Let's, let's blow them up in every way we can. Um, he can't get away with all of the things he wants to do, but he has turned the opinion of the base against China. Yeah, I think it's more than the base, Jay. It's the public opinion in the United States is 60, 70% anti-China right now. That's beyond his base. 
Yeah, you're right. But this is pure politics, I think, more than anything else. And let's say Trump gets reelected, uh, you know, and within the first three months, he may go to China. It doesn't mean that anything will happen. I think he's using this as a political weapon because he thinks he can score points against Biden on this particular issue, which, yeah. again, just puts more pressure on Japan. Right. And in, in, uh, yeah. the lead up to the election just makes it harder for Japan to parse this balancing act between China and Japan, it's uh, China yeah. and the United States, I mean. So, yeah, um, th there are elements of that in, um, in Japan too. Uh, there are Japanese people uh, and Japanese politicians that are hawkish and think that Japan should be more aggressive about limiting um, this uh, push by China, certainly for territorial push in the Asia Pacific region. And they seem to be, actually becoming more powerful. So this economic influence is certainly there, uh, but it seems to be diminishing somewhat. Uh, and the people, the politicians who are saying we need to be more strongly anti-China and be explicit about that. So in the news just recently, uh, this state visit that I mentioned to you earlier that was scheduled for April um, and had del was delayed because of COVID, it's been left open as to when it will occur. So Abe is still saying we, were, we will invite uh, President Xi into uh, Japan at some point. However, these the more right wing, the hawkish uh, politicians now are saying we should cancel the invitation entirely because of the way China is behaving right now. And they give the example of Hong Kong and the Secaucus Islands where there is this territorial dispute. So there is, I think, lately maybe somewhat because of the influence of Trump and the China, you know, the the China flu, you know, calling it the Wuhan flu rather than Corona like the rest of the world does. I think that is having some influence and it's giving maybe more credence or uh, more cover for the right-wing politicians in Japan that look beyond the economics and just want to limit China in the region for purely for political reasons. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people in China that, uh, that are mad at Japan too. Um, well, my, yeah. The, my the last China trip to, to China, I found people talking down Japan. Um, and, and well, really the Chinese that. government uses this, this as a political weapon as well. In the same way Trump uses China to excite his base and create a boogeyman, you know, let's, let's say China. Uh, China sometimes does that against Japan. And this, Jay, this is another huge issue to talk about. And that is China and Japan's relationship during the colonial period in World War II. So there are still... Uh, enduring uh, issues of, uh, you know, hatred and yeah, red, about what red, Japan, Japan did. Japan, yeah, yeah it backed in World War II. So it's very easy for the Chinese government to reignite that and, and talk about the atrocities that the Japanese government uh, carried out during the colonial period and during World War II. Nanjing is, is the, the famous example, which many of these right-wing Japanese politicians deny even happened. You know, hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Chinese people were killed by the Japanese military, according to mainstream historians. But in Japan, they deny that. There's a certain segment of the of politicians and segment of, of society that denies that. So I, that hasn't been in evidence in the last uh, five years or so, or so, but, you know, 10 years ago, it was pretty, pretty open. And there were Chinese people, maybe that's when you went, Jay, to China. There were Chinese people protesting in the street and burning Japanese cars, attacking Japanese businesses uh, because of political... It was, it was a big, uh, it was, there was a soccer field, a soccer game. I don't know if you remember. Um, mm, no. Between a, a Japan team and a Chinese team in China. And they got into a whole mob scene fighting each other about it in the soccer yeah. state. So that, that erupts periodically. It's been fairly calm. I mean, the earlier part of this year, China, the official press was being somewhat complimentary of Japan uh, because Japan was being more cooperative with COVID and was sending masks and equipment to China initially. So there's been, at least at that national level, kind of a calm period that we're in right now. But at any given point, any given incident, something breaks out, it, it could revert back to that overt nationalism in yeah. China and also to some extent here in Japan. You know, you, you mentioned, Steve, about uh, the constitution, call it the MacArthur constitution in, in Japan. 
where the yeah. military can only be used for defensive purposes. And right. And although um, you know that there have been exceptions to that over the years, that's still the constitution and that's still the basic rule of how uh, Japan and its military, you know, get along. Um, but but query, you know, if there was fisticuffs, say in the Senkaku Islands or any anywhere where China is trying to establish, um, you know, extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, and camp on other jurisdictions um, and uh, take advantage, if you will, on territorial grounds. I mean, it, it happens. China does this regularly. Most, most recently was in India, in the Himalayas, a big fight on a mountaintop between Chinese and Indian troops. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, but they keep on pushing, always pushing. So the question really is, with that constitution, can China fight back? Uh, can China can Japan protect, fight back? I'm sorry, can Japan fight back? Can Japan, Japan protect itself um, against Chinese aggression? Um, y- yes. Yeah, Japan has the right to defend itself. And, and of course, that can be construed in a variety of different ways. But frankly, the US-Japan Security Alliance is still as strong as ever. So. Japan still exists under U.S. military protection, right? So if a conflict was to break out between Japan and China, the U.S. would be involved. So that's Mm -hmm. that's still, I mean, a very important element to this overall relationship. Another reason why Japan has to be so careful in terms of how it deals with the United States, because it has, since World War II, uh, depended on the Je- the U.S. military to protect it. I mean, it. Japan has the number one military behind it. And I, I think any president, whether it be Trump or Biden or, or whomever, if Japan was threatened in some way by China, would probably intercede, even Taiwan. I mean, I, there, there could be a military reaction by the United States if China was for some crazy reason that they decided to invade Taiwan. Now that, that I kind of won't do that, I don't think. But uh, if they did, the U.S. would probably have a response. So, so that's the that's a bigger context of any type of conflict between Japan and mm-hmm. China. If something breaks out, the United States military planes will be flying, you know, over where wherever this uh, this breakout has occurred, and and U.S. ships would be coming in. And China knows that, and Japan knows that. Yeah, we we got to maintain that kind of deterrence. I think it's very important for. The interests of the United States, not only. Yeah, and you have, I think it's 40,000 American uh, soldiers in Japan, as you do in Korea. So they're all over the place. Okinawa, you know, they're all over the place. So the United States military presence is is just dominant. Now, what about the economy? You mentioned that there are a a lot of uh, Japanese businesses with offices in China. and, And for that matter, I guess it goes both ways. Chinese businesses with offices in Japan. And yeah, Japan is and, China's third biggest trading partner. Yeah. So the, the question is, uh, how does that affect all this? I mean, it seems to me that's a sort of a, a point of conciliation because you, you don't want to disrupt economic relations with anybody. If you're sure. making money at it, you know, like, like right. try to stay friendly. Uh, what, what do you get on that particular dynamic? Oh, yeah, that, that's a very, very important factor. Um, For example, tourism, which up until COVID had been Japan's fastest growing industry segment. International tourism had gone from uh, five, six years ago, maybe 5 million international visitors to over 30 million international visitors. And the biggest group, Chinese. I mean, they're they're, during the peak periods, you know, up through the early part of uh, this year and also 2019, there were almost 10 million Chinese people who came to Japan to visit generating tremendous amounts of revenue because Chinese people love buying Japanese goods because they have a petition for high quality. I mean, this is kind of a cliche. We, everyone in Japan knows that Chinese tourists come here and they buy a whole variety of medicines and consumer items and diapers, everything that they mistrust the Chinese manufacturers in making, they buy here and wrap it up. And so that's a huge part of the uh, Japanese economy and the most successful growth segment. And it really rests on the relationship with China. Now, unfortunately that has all gone away because of COVID, but once we have a vaccine, Japan and China will both do as much as they can to try and rebuild that 
and have tourism begin to go back and forth, but mostly Chinese people coming to Japan. So that's a very clear example of how important economically the relationship between the two countries is. Are, are Japanese people, I mean, customarily before COVID, uh, do they buy a lot of things from China? I mean, China may not have the same quality of manufacturing, you know, that no. they don't buy no. things from China. No, no, um, it doesn't work the other way. It's a very simple example. My wife is Japanese and she told me to go to the store to buy honey. And I bought some honey and I didn't look very closely. It was made in China, threw it away. She wouldn't even have it in the refrigerator. I had to go back and get honey from New Zealand. That's okay. So there is a general perception on the part of Japanese that Chinese products, the quality is low. And they get this from the Chinese people because the Chinese people tell them that. And the Chinese people say, yeah, our stuff is terrible. Don't buy it. So there isn't uh, that kind of uh, same awareness. Chinese people view Japanese products as high quality. Japanese people view Chinese products as low quality. Mm. But the trade that's occurring is on manufacturing level, you know, of so many Japanese companies are manufacturing their products in China and then shipping from China to U.S. This is how it all works. So that lays the basis for this economic trade agreement between the two countries. It's more on the manufacturing side, not so much on the consumer side, at least from Japan's perspective. Well, you know, I read recently that the number one automobile manufacturing country now is China. They're making yes. tons of cars and they have somehow lifted American technology to make those cars pretty well. Um, and I suppose they probably lifted Japanese technology too. I don't know exactly how good those cars are against Japanese cars, which are, you know, to me are the world's best, but, but um, query whether anybody's driving a Chinese car in Japan. I don't think I've ever seen a Chinese car here in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> there's, and I, it's actually hard to find American cars. BMW, Audi, there's a few European brands. They have been successful, but uh, Japan protects its auto industry very carefully. Toyota, Honda, and all of those companies have worked very closely with the LDP to make sure that it's difficult for foreign manufacturers of cars to be successful in Japan, although there are, there are some exceptions. The United States manufacturers, they've all given up. They're, they're not even really here. So, but China, GM, that they sell more cars in China than they do in the United States. GM does. Mm. That is their growth opportunity. And that market, you're right, Jay, even with COVID, the automotive industry in China is growing now. There are more cars being bought now because China managed COVID in a much better way and things are bouncing back now. Well, they're, they're number one in so many things. You know, they're number one in AI. Uh, they're number one in, in manufacturing solar cells. Uh, they've made up their mind to do that, and they've done that. But we're almost out of time, Steve, and I want to ask you one last question. I mean, what, 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 what's coming home to me here is that the relationship uh, with, between Japan and China is it's, it has, it, the U.S. is involved in that relationship. You can't, you can't answer the question unless you can imagine how what the U.S. will do under Trump or under Biden. Um, and so it's an, it's an unanswerable until the election, really, uh, because things will or can change then. But my question to you, though, it's a slightly personal, is would, do you see yourself as going to China now or in the future? Now in COVID, um, at, after COVID, at, you know? Yeah, I, at this point in my life, um, no. If I was coming out of college, I used to advise my students, they come to Japan and I'm very happy to have them here, but the Japan economic prospects are, are limited because of demographic issues, things we've talked about in previous shows. Mm. Uh, the market opportunity is in India and in China. So I used to give them the advice that you really should think about these countries. It's like when I came to Japan, Japan was on the upswing. You know, I was lucky to be here at that time. However, today, that's a little bit more complicated, isn't it? And the other thing, too, is that there are so many smart Chinese graduates of U.S. schools. So if you're an American and you graduate from a good school and you want to do business in China, you have to compete with Chinese people who are fluent in the language, right? So it's, it's a bit of a challenge. I think, actually, I was talking with a friend of mine yesterday about where we would go to. And it's, it's actually Vietnam, uh, maybe Myanmar, 
And some of these Southeast Asian economies, which are beginning just to break out of the, the old uh, you know, top-down Stalinist, Chinese Communist, Maoist models, and now are opening up to the world economy, that's where tremendous growth opportunities are. That's where it'd be a lot of fun to be, maybe as a teacher or more importantly, as a businessman or businesswoman. So that if, if a student was to come into my office right now and ask me, you know, where should I, which, where should I think about where would I want to, where would I suggest that they go to? I would say, look at these countries. Have you been to Vietnam, Jay? No, we were, Have you ever visited there? were going to go and COVID stopped us. You know. Oh, it's too bad. It's, it's a wonderful country. The, the people are so friendly. Uh, and you just, you get that vibe that things are going on. It's, it's like being in Hong Kong uh, or being in, in uh, Shanghai. You just have a feeling this country is progressing and moving forward. Oh, you know, I, I, do good. Want to, I do want to discuss that exact point with you. Uh, okay. And we get together. I mean, we're All looking, right. looking east from Japan, what do you see for the future for Japanese business and Japanese Japanese students and what have you. Anyway, we're out of time. Steve Zercher, uh, Kansai Gaidai University, enlightening us um, about looking east. Thank you so much, Steve. Yeah, my pleasure, Jay, as always. Look forward to our next show. Aloha.